everyone. Walter Bound here. Uh, so, uh, Picture of Dorian Gray, the preface to the Picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, fantastic piece. He added this after he got so much heat for his piece. Very controversial. And he uh, put this into the next edition in order to speak to his critics for saying he wrote an immoral work and it was indecent and whatever. So let's go through it. All right, I'm doing a little rhetorical analysis. That means I'm looking at the choices that Wilde uses to make his point, right? And we say rhetoric is the art of persuasion. So this piece, in a way, is an art of persuasion. And, but what is he actually persuading us to believe? It might be the very opposite of what he's writing, right? Which is, you know, it's like I'm writing it for my critics to, you know, make them listen, whatever. It's just a piece of art. Don't think I'm crazy just because I wrote some crazy stuff. But it really could be, okay, they'll believe that. But really, people will think this is really my message and that I do have a use of my art. And I do want to uh, address topics like homosexuality that are illegal in Britain yeah, at the time, right? Late um, 19th century. All right, so let's go through this. And let's take a look at, and I'll use some of the uh, rhetorical devices and the terms that, you know, you should know. And also, more importantly, apply and use, right? So he says, the artist is the creator of beautiful things. This is the declarative sentence. is a simple sentence. Means the subject and the verb are placed right at the beginning. The artist is. This is his opinion. It sets the topic for discussion. This seems like a truism, valid on its surface, but it's an effective hook. It's so simple. Who can disagree with this, right? So if you're writing persuasion, don't write something right in the beginning that people are going to say, no, I disagree with you. No, let everyone agree with you in the beginning. It's a great way, right? To reveal art and conceal the art, the artist is art's aim, right? This is using an antithesis. It's using opposites. Great verses from the Bible, Abraham Lincoln. I mean, the great writers, Martin Luther King, they know how to use antithesis. He's using opposites night and day, heaven and hell. Here he's revealing and concealing. This creates symmetry and balance in writing. The statement is also ironic. Why? As a writer, artist, don't you want to share with the world what is going on with you? How do you see the world? Is Oscar Wilde really being serious here? He was initially criticized for creating an immoral work with the picture of Dorian Gray, a late Gothic, amazing story that must have revealed his immorality. So he added the preface as a statement about art uh, is more essential than the artist. So the art is more essential than the artist. Right. And we can debate that. We can, and this is all debatable. An example is, is Stephen King an awful person because he creates horrible people and situations in his stories? Well, no. Right. I once got in trouble with sharing a story um, of mine and I made a student uncomfortable and she thought I was kind of like not a decent person because I would write about something. And I'm like, all right, uh, number one, I learned not to share a lot of what I write. But at the same time, like, just because I write about a character who does or thinks something weird or different or immoral doesn't mean I'm immoral because vice is, you know, why do we watch movies and we read? We want to read about things that are difficult, that are maybe disturbing, right? So the critic, he says, is one who can translate into another manner or new material his impression of beautiful things. The highest as the lowest form of criticism, the mode of autobiography. Right, again, here he addresses the critics of art example, his art. As readers or consumers of art, we are critical. I love that show. I hate that show. We say that stuff all the time. I love that song. I hate that song. Well, what are your reasons for not liking the Americans or you or, you know, Lucifer? So critics can see things in art that other people cannot see. That makes sense. That's why we love food critics, right? Um, they are chefs. They know their business. But he uses antithesis again, high, low, and criticizes critics for only seeing through one's eyes. So if you're a critic of art and you're looking at a Van Gogh or a Van Gogh, right, um, that you might think it's garbage or you might think Moby Dick is garbage the way people thought of Melville at the time. But it wasn't the critic that was wrong. It was the critic that was wrong. The art was right, right? Um, this is where autobiography gets in the way of sight and appreciation. Right, and then he writes... Those who find ugly meanings and beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fault. Those who find beautiful meanings and beautiful things are the cultivated. All right. So here he's using what is called an aphorism. 
An aphorism is a short statement of truth, like a proverb. He uses antithesis again. This is his primary rhetorical mode. All right, he uses a lot of antithesis,、uh, beautiful and ugly. Those refers back to the critics of art and his work. Can one be corrupt and charming? Yeah, you'll need to read the novel. Picture of Dorian Gray, or watch like Lucifer on Netflix, which is kind of a fun show.、Uh, he's corrupt, but he's charming as anything, right? So the critics who see ugly in his beautiful work are not worth listening to, but the critics who see beauty within beauty, well, that's solid and great. And then Oscar Wilde writes, "For these, there is hope. They are the elect to whom beautiful things mean only beauty. The elect are like the chosen ones, right? These are the people that are at the highest." There is no such thing as a moral or immoral work. So, if you see like a book has been banned for immorality, Oscar Wilde will disagree with you. It's just well written or badly written. That is all. We can debate that, but this is the idea of, you know, he's addressing his critics here. My book is not immoral. Picture of Dorian Gray is not immoral. It's either well written or badly written, and we all know it's well written. I'm Oscar Wilde. I'm the greatest writer, Irish writer in Britain. I'm, I'm celebrated, right? Um, so he's addressing his critics. He uses another, another aphorism: moral, immoral, well, and bad. Critics thought his novel was immoral because so many people do immoral things, right? That you have to read the book to see what they do. But since it was so well written and beautiful, it should stand as beauty.、Right. This might also cause you confusion. The 19th century dislike of realism is the rage of Caliban seeing his face in the mirror, in the glass. The 19th dislike of romanticism. So again, we have. Antithesis, realism, romanticism. We have a, a, we have apostrophe.、Um, we have an aphra with the nineteenth century, nineteenth century, using the same rhetorical structure at the beginning, and using、uh, apostrophe at the end by using glass. Right? Again, this is getting a little sophisticated, but it, it's really well balanced. Right?、Um, the nineteenth century dislike of romanticism is the rage of Caliban not seeing. So seeing, not seeing. Realism, romanticism. This is all antithesis with anaphora and epistrophe, and all these rhetorical modes help enhance the beauty, the symmetry, and the meaning. Right. All right. So, who is Caliban, and what is realism and romanticism?、Uh, when you're reading stuff and you don't know what it is,、um, you can always look it up. Right. So,、um, an illusion is a reference to another piece of art, person, character, etc. So, Caliban here.、Um, Is an illusion from Shakespeare's、uh, *The Tempest*, a great play,、uh, one of his last great plays that he wrote,、um, and it should not be confused with illusion. Like it does not exist. It was an illusion.、Uh, an illusion helps the reader understand a concept because we can connect. Like I felt like Yoda, or he stood there like Achilles, right? So. If you get the illusion, it's like you don't need to describe. It's already pre-established. All right, it's like this archetype that's there already. He stood there looking like、uh, Hagrid, all right, with his crazy hair, which kind of like、uh, Hagrid hair today. So if you said like if you used、uh, he looked like Harry Potter, Potter's the illusion, right? Not everyone is going to get the illusions, right? Use the illusions that make sense to you, and allow your reader the intellectual curiosity. To find out who this person or this work is, right?、Um, and if they don't, that's okay. They just say, "Oh, I don't get it," and then they move on.、Uh, so Caliban is a famous character from Shakespeare's *The Tempest*. He's an illiterate native of, of dark complexion of an island that was conquered by a white European man, right? So named Prospero, who's a magician, right? He civilizes and abuses the native and teaches him language. And Caliban curses him because he can now、uh, he now has language. I should fix that. Because he now has language、uh, to curse his awful fate, right?、Um, the story is a parable of the harm of colonization. Shakespeare was writing this at the end of his productive life when Europe was colonizing the New World, right? So here we have. So Caliban here is this metaphor that he's using, the symbol, and realism. And romanticism are opposites. One stresses logic and reason, realism, all right, the age of reason. The other, emotion and intuition and passion, that is romanticism. Like we'll be we'll be discussing this in our course of discussion of literature and art in class. Mozart, for example, was classical, right? Beethoven, he's a romantic, right? 
you can think of them both as you know, cl- you know, you know, classical music, but they're writing in very different time periods, right? Uh, the 18th century was largely the age of reason. Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, uh, Adam Smith. And the late 18th century, 19th century was the Romantic period. In America, it ended in 1861 with the Civil War. In Europe, it ended sooner. Um, but like Napoleon, yeah, that's the Romantic period, right? Uh, realism comes back in the late 19th and 20th century. So someone like Jefferson would not want to see the savage in the mirror, right? Because it's like that's no, I'm civilized. I'm I I, I think I'm like Spock. I use I use logic and reason, right? And I write the Declaration of Independence. I own slaves too, but it's not. I don't want to talk about that. Um, but Walt Whitman is a romantic. He would hate not seeing his the savage in the mirror. Okay, because he wanted to get to, you know, like the, the, this idea of the noble savage or you know primitive man. Primitive meaning primary, right? So it's just different time periods looking at the same character from different perspectives. And we'll talk about the Zeitgeist, the German, uh, the German uh, thing of the spirit of the times, right? Uh, so he, he writes: the moral life of man forms part of the subject matter of the artist, but the morality of art consists in the perfect use of an imperfect medium. No artist d- desires to prove anything; even things that are true can be proved. All right? Notice the brilliant use of opposites. I should have this highlighted blue. All right, but let me just highlight it here for you. Um, so we have moral life of man, morality of art, imperfect, perfect, right? The morals of the writer help the writer know what to write about, right? But morality of art exists in an imperfect world. It's ironic. Right? No artist has ethical sympathies. That's what Oscar Wilde writes. Whether he writes it and believes it is something totally different. It's sort of like sarcasm in a way. Oh, you look great today. Like, do I really look great? So. Oftentimes we need to read between the lines, and maybe he has one message for one audience and a subtler message for his smarter audience or smarter critics. Right? An ethical sympathy in an artist is an unpardonable mannerism of style. Right? No artist is ever morbid. The artist can express everything. Right? So does Wilde really believe this? Should art exist just for itself? Now this idea of aestheticism. Like art for art's sake, which was all the rage, or should art exist for change, um, for like a revolution? Like if you're writing a short story that shows um, the abuse of um, or the, the mistreatment of African Americans in, in jail, or the plights of women, or uh, Black Lives Matter, or you know all sorts of things, right? Um, because. Oscar Wilde was thrown in jail for homosexuality in Britain. It was illegal to be homosexual. Oscar Wilde was married, but that was just for society. You know, he's gay, and he was found out, thrown in jail, um, and he was later exiled. Died in a hotel in Paris. And his last words, I think this is what he last said, is like he hated the wallpaper. And he said, "Well, one of us had to go. You know, one of us had to go. It's so funny. He just hated the wallpaper, and even even in the end, he was witty. It's funny, right? Um, so, a work that shows men loving other men, which is what Picture of Dorian Gray shows, we don't. You know, it's p- largely platonic, meaning like they're just really, really close friends. But maybe it's a little bit more than that. So maybe Picture of Dorian Gray actually does serve." A purpose other than just being beautiful, right? So it's something we can debate, All right? Um, and and this is where the waters get the waters get tricky. Sometimes the moral of the story gets in the way of the story. It's too obvious, right? And that's what he's criticizing here. The word morbid means characterized by or appealing to an abnormal or unhealthy interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects. Like if you always want to talk about death, or like your emo, I'm like, oh, that, that he's so morbid. That Morrissey is so morbid. The Cure, they're so morbid. I'm really dating myself with those bands, but um, Poe isn't morbid just because he writes about unpleasant things, right? Wilde says that the writer can write about anything and still make it beautiful as art. So again, this is Oscar Wilde's opinion, but really, what is his opinion and what is his objective? There's like the, there's the 
implicit and there's the implied and all these kind of like there's the there's this surface and then there's the underneath surface there's the obvious and then there's the not so obvious this is where reading gets tricky right he says thoughts and language uh, are instruments to an art vice and virtue are artists uh, materials for an art this is antithesis also epistrophe using the word art at the end of each sentence it creates balance and enhances the point he does this so frequently right why do we crave horror movies and love films like pulp fiction it's disturbing but why do we watch it right um artists use vice and virtue as materials grist for their mill right from the point of view of form he writes the type of all arts is the, is the art of the musician from the point of view of feeling the actor's craft is the type all art is at once surface and symbol those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. I love that. I love that line. It's one of my favorite lines. Uh readers can read a story and understand the story, the plot. So oftentimes you might read a book, read a novel, the teacher gives you a test. You 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 understand the plot, you understand the characters, you know what happens, you get 100, but you really don't know what the story is really about because you didn't go beneath the surface. All right. like Moby Dick is, you know, hunting god, all right? And a blasphemer, Ahab, right? Um Hagrid is the wild man archetype who helps the young boy achieve manhood, Harry Potter. My job as a teacher is to get you to understand the deeper depths, the meaning. But Wilde warns us about those depths. You may not like what you see down there, right? When Harry Potter has to go into the thought thing and he puts his memory in there and he sees dark stuff and he has to go face ultimate darkness facing Voldemort. Yeah, that's some scary stuff. It's really scary that he realizes what appeals to Voldemort so much, the power, the corruption and just like Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, right? This is just but we have to recognize this if we don't, it could actually hurt us or we become evil if we don't understand the darker depths of our lives and the human lives. And then he says, those who read the symbol do so at their peril. it is the spectator and not life that really that art really mirrors so this is ironic we think of art revealing life right like still life is it still life is it like still not moving or is it life it's like still life right it's like it's still living even though it might be dead or something so it's this this double meaning of things um the viewer of the play it's the reader the the viewer the listener to music that art really mirrors and wild flips this idea right diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work is new complex and vital wild writes when critics disagree the artist is in accord with himself we can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as it is an admire it right a bit of irony there and it's a bit of witty it's it's witty the only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely So why is so much written about the Bible, the Torah, Shakespeare, the Great Gatsby? So many articles, essays, films, denominations. Why do we have Lutherans and Presbyterians and Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox? It's because it's so much symbolism and we have different interpretations of that symbolism. Van Gogh, Melville, Fitzgerald, great artists were oftentimes ignored in their lifetime. Melville said, "I wrote a book uh for an audience that doesn't really exist yet." Right, Moby Dick. Eventually, you know, the world caught up with him in the 20th century and he became like, you know, the very famous Herman Melville Moby Dick. Um but sometimes these artists are ahead of their times. Like Oscar Wilde being gay in Britain, he hopefully would fit in very well in America. Um in parts of America. Um and he could he could be married and no one's going to throw him in jail, right? Um but we had to catch up to him. Right? We had to catch up to him. right i think we still have to catch up to a lot of these writers who were so ahead of their time right um and sometimes we admire things too much useful things too much like a smartphone oh the smartphone is going to save my life it's so vital it may not all actually be all that vital it's useful but is it going to make you any happier right and then he says all art is quite useless now we can really debate this again does he really mean this i think he's being provocative here he's being a flame thrower um but will it cure cancer will it help you sleep will it will it heat up my food Ugh, okay not foot will it heat up my food more quickly is it okay that art is useless is it just beauty that is okay uh i'm not sure that wild really means this it's really open for debate so um again understanding uh the motivations of an artist sometimes 
uh, we need to distrust what they say or not just distrust, but maybe there's the real meaning beneath what they're actually writing. All right. So um, hopefully this helped understand the preface to the picture of Dorian Gray. I would uh, advise you to read it if you can listen to it on Audible. There's a great version of it. Um, I forget the reader of it, but he's very famous and it's, it's, it's really, really good. Uh, take care, everyone. Bye bye.